Ashley Brock, reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 4. Ethan didn't mind music when he worked. The fact was, his taste in music was both broad and electric. Another gift of the Quinns, the house had often been filled with it. His mother had played a fine piano with as much enthusiasm for the works of Choplin as for those of Scott Joplin. Choplin, Choplin, as for those of Scott Joplin. His father's musical talent had been the violin, and it was the instrument Ethan had gravitated to. He enjoyed the varying moods of it and its portability. Still, he found music a waste of sound. Sound, whenever he was concentrating on a job, as he usually didn't hear it after ten minutes anyway. Silence suited him best during those times, but Seth liked the radio in the boatyard up and up loud. So to keep peace, Ethan simply turned out tuned out the head punching rock and roll. The whole of the boat had been caulked and filled, a labor intense and time consuming task. Seth had been a lot of help there. Ethan meant it, giving him an extra pair of hands and feet when he needed them. Though Christ knew the boy could complain about the job as much as Philip did, Ethan turned that out as well, tuned that out as well to stay sane. He helped to finish leveling off the deck before Philip arrived for the weekend, planted first on a diagonal, then across the next at a right angle. With any luck, he could get some solid work done that weekend, the next on the cabin and cockpit. Seth bitched about being on sanding detail, but he didn't. He did a decent job at it. Ethan only had to tell him to go back and hit portions of the hull planking again a couple of times. He didn't mind the boys' questions either, though he had a million of them once he started. What's this piece over there for? The bulkhead for the cockpit. Why'd you cut it out already? Because we want to get rid of all the dust before we varnish and seal. What's all that other shit? Ethan paused. And his homework, looking down from his position to where Seth frowned at a stack of per cut lumber. You got the sides and cabin ends, the door, tour rail, and drop boards. Seems like an awful lot of pieces for one stupid boat. There's going to be more. There's going to be a lot more. How come this guy doesn't just buy a boat that's already built? Good thing for us, he did, he isn't. The client's deep pockets, he's amused, were given both by Clint its foundation. Because he liked the other boat I built for him. And so he can tell all his big shot friends he had a boat designed and hand built for him. Seth changed his sandpaper and applied himself again. He didn't mind the work really, and he liked the smells of wood and varnish and the linseed oil too, but he just didn't get it. It's taken forever to put it together. Been at least in been at least in it's been at less than three months. Lots of people spend a year, even longer, to build a wooden boat. Says Jolto, a year? Jesus, Ethan! A little loud and variable, normal whine made Ethan's mouth which Relax, this isn't going to take us that long. Once Cam gets back and put in a full days on it, we'll move along. And once school's out, you can pick up a lot of the grunt. School is out, huh? Today was it. Now Seth grinned, whine right. Freedom! It's a done deal. Today, pausing his work, Ethan around. I thought you had it a couple of days yet. Nope. He lost track of things somewhere, he supposed. It wasn't Seth's style, not yet anyway, to volunteer information. <sighs> Did you get a report card? Yeah, I passed. Let's say Ethan set his tools down, brushed his hands on his hands. Where is it? Seth shrugged his shoulders, kept standing, saying it. It's in my backpack over there. No big deal. Let's see it. Ethan repeated. Seth did what Ethan considered his usual dance, rolling his eyes, shrugging his shoulders, adding a long-suffering sigh. Oddly enough, he didn't he end it with a note, as he was prone to. He walked over to where he dumped his backpack and rifled through it. Ethan leaned down over the port side to take the paper Seth held up. Noting the mutinous expression on Seth's face, he expected the news would be grim. His stomach did a quick clench and roll. Required lecture, Ethan knew, thought was an inner sigh, <laughs> was going to be damned uncomfortable for both of them. Ethan studied the thin, computer-generated sheet, pushing back his cap, stretched his head. Always. Set jerk his shoulder again, stopped seeing his pocket. Yeah, so? I've never seen a report card with all A's before. Even Ethan used to have some B's, and maybe C tossed in. Embarrassed in the fear of being caught egghead or something equally hideous, was simply, it's no big deal. He held up a hand for the report card, but Ethan shook The hell it isn't. But he saw Seth's growl. Thought he understood it. It was always hard to be different from that. You've got a good brain, and you ought to be proud of it. It's just there. It's not like knowing how to pilot a boat or anything. You got a good brain, and you use it. You'll figure out how to do most anything. 
Ethan folded the paper carefully and tucked it in his pocket. Damn, if he wasn't going to show it off some. Seems to me we ought to go get a pizza or something. Puzzled, sat there and was like, you packed those lame sandwiches for dinner. Not good enough now. First time a queen gets straight A's out of rate, at least pizza. He saw Seth's mouth open and shut. Or the staggering delight leap into his eyes before he loaded him. Sure, that'd be cool. Can you hold off another hour? No problem. Seth grabbed his sandpaper and began to work furiously and blindly. His eyes were dazzled. His heart in his throat it happened whenever one of them referred to him as a queen. He knew his name was Lautner still. <sighs> But hearing Ethan call McQuinn made that little beam of hope that Ray had first initiated in him months before shine just a little brighter. He was going to stay. He was going to be one of them. He was never going back into hell again. Made it worse being called down to Morfield's office that day. The vice principal had reeled him in an hour before freedom and had made his stomach jitter, as it always did. But she sat him down, told him she was proud of his progress. Man, how mortifying. Okay, so maybe he hadn't punched anybody in the face in the last couple months. And he'd been handling in his stupid homework assignments every dumb day because someone was always nagging him about them. Philip was worse nagging in this particular area. It was like the guy was a homework cop or something. Seth thought now, and yeah, he'd been raising his hand in class now and then just for the hell of it. But to have Morning for singing him out the way he had been so blech, he decided he almost wished he'd held his butt in to give him another dose of ISS. But if a bunch of dopey A's made a guy like Ethan happy, it was okay. Ethan was absolutely cool in Seth's estimation. He worked outside all day and his hands and scars were really thick house. Seth figured you could practically pound nails in Ethan's hands without him even feeling it. They were so hard and tough. He owned two boats that he built himself and he knew everything about the bay and sailing and it didn't make him a big deal. It didn't make a big deal about it. A couple months back Seth had watched High Noon on TV even though it had been in lame black and white and there hadn't even been any blood or explosions. He thought then that Ethan was like that Gary Cooper guy. He didn't say a lot, so you mostly listened when he did, and he just did what needed to be done without a long, lot of snow, lot of show. Ethan would have faced down the bad guys too, cause it was right. Seth had mulled it over for a while and had decided that's what a hero was, somebody who just did what was right. Ethan would have been stunned and mortally embarrassed if he'd been able to read Seth's thoughts. The boy was an expert at keeping them to himself. On that level, he and Ethan were as close as twins. It might have crossed Ethan's mind that Village Pizza was only a short block from Shining's pub where Grace would be starting her shift, but he didn't mention it. Couldn't take the boy into a bar anyway. Ethan mused as they headed into the bright lights and noise of the local restaurant. Seth was bound to complain loudly if Ethan asked him to wait in the car for just a couple minutes while he poked his head in. Likely, Grace would complain plain to if she caught on that he was checking on her <laughs> it was best to let it go and concentrate on the matters at hand he tucked his hands into his back pockets studied the menu posted on the wall behind the counter what do you want on it you can forget the mushrooms they're gross <laughs> Were of mine there, he's murmuring. Pepperoni and hot sausage, Seth sneered but he spoiled it by bouncing a little in his sneakers if you can handle it, I can take it if you can. Hey, Justin, he said with a smile of greeting for the boy behind the counter. We'll take a large pepperoni and hot sausage and a couple of jumbo Pepsis. You got it. Here here to go. He then scanned a dozen tables and booths, offering, offered a note that he wasn't the only one who thought to celebrate the last day of school with pizza. Go nab that last booth back there, Seth. We'll take it in here, Justin. Have a seat. We'll bring the drinks out. Seth had dumped his backpack on the bench and was tapping his hands on the table on time to the blast of Hootie and the Blowfish from the jukebox. I'm going to kick some video ass, he told Ethan. When Ethan reached back for his wallet, Seth shook his hand. I got money. Not tonight, you know. Ethan said and mildly pulled out some bills. It's your party. Get some change. Cool. Ethan snagged the bills and raced off to get quarters. As Ethan slid into the booth, he wondered why so many people thought a couple hours in a nursery room was high entertainment. I know if kids was already trying to kick some video ass as the trio of machines along the back wall. The jute had switched to Clint Black and that country boy was wailing. Toddler in the booth behind him was having a full-blown tantrum and a group of teenage girls were giggling at a decibel level that would have made Simon's ears bleed. What a way to spend a pretty summer night. Then he saw Elise, Liz Crawford, and Junior with their two little girls at a nearby booth. One of the girls, they mu that must be Stacy, Ethan thought, was talking quickly, making wide gestures while the rest of the family howled with laughter. They made a unit amuse, their own little island in the midst of the jarring lights and noise. He supposed that's what family was, an island. Knowing you could go there 
made all the difference. Still, the tug of envy surprised him. Made him shift uncomfortably on the hard seat of the booth and scrawl into space. He made his mind up about having a family years before. He didn't care for the sharp pull of longing. Why, Ethan, you look fierce. He glanced up at the drinks were set on the table in front of him, straight into the flirtatious eyes of Linda Brewster. She was a looker, no question about it. The tight black jeans and scoop neck black t shirt hugged her well developed body like a coat of fresh paint on a classic Chevy. After her divorce was final one week ago, Monday, she treated herself to a manicure and a new hairdo. Her corn. Curl tipped nails skimmed through her newly bubbled straight blonde hair as she smiled down at Ethan. She had her eye on him for a time now. After all, she had separated from that useless Tom Brewster more than a year before, and a woman had to look to the future. Ethan Gwynn would be hot in bed, she decided. She had instincts about these things. Those big hands of his would be mighty thorough, she was sure, and attentive. Oh, yes. She liked his looks, too, just a little tough and weathered, and that slow, sexy smile of his when he managed to drag one out of him just made her want to lick her lips in anticipation. He had that quiet way about him. Linda knew what they said about still waters, and she was just dying to see just how deep Ethan Quinn's ran. Ethan was well aware from her eye. Ethan was well aware her eye had wandered, and he was keeping his peel as well for a running room. Women like Linda scared the hell out of him. Uh, Linda didn't know you were working here. Or he'd have avoided Bill's future like the plague. <laughs> Just helped my father out for a couple of weeks. She was a flat broke, and her father, the owner of Village Peter, had told her he'd be damned if she was going to sponge off him and her mother. She could get her sassy butt to work. Haven't seen you around lately. I've been around. He wished she'd move along. Her perfume gave him the jitters. I heard you and your brothers rented that old barn of clay moths and are building boats. I've been meaning to come down and take a look. Not much to see. Where the hell was Seth when he needed him? He just wondered a little desperately. How long could those damn quarters last? <laughs> I like to see it anyway. She skimmed those silk tip nails down his arm, gave him a low purr as she felt the ridge of muscles. I can slip out of here for a while. Why don't you run me down there and show me what's what? His mind blanked for a moment. He was only human. She was running her tongue over her top lip in a way designed to draw a man's eye and tickle his glands. Now that he was interested, not that he was interested, not a bit, but it had been a long time since he had a woman moaning under him, and it had a feeling Linda would be a champion moaner. <laughs> cop two, cop two. Cop top score. Seth plopped into the booth. Flush with victory and grabbed his pe Pepsi. He slurped some. Man, what's keeping that pizza? I'm starved. He's the fellow's blood starts to run again and nearly sad with relief. It'll be along. Well, despite an annoyance of the interruption, Linda smiled brightly at Seth. This must be the new edition. What's your name, honey? I can't quite recollect. I'm Seth. And he sized her up quickly. Bimbo. What's this person last thought? Seen plenty of them in his short life. Who are you? I'm Linda, an old friend of Ethan's. My daddy owns the place. Cool. So maybe you could tell him to put a fire under the pizza before we die of old age. Seth, the word in Ethan's quiet look, or all it took for the boy to close his mouth. <laughs> Your daddy still makes the best pizza on the shore. Ethan said with an easier smile. You be sure to tell him. I will, and you give me a call, Ethan. She will go to her left hand. I'm a free woman these days. She wanted her way, hip swinging, like a well-old man to tone. She smells like that place at the mall where they sell all that girl stuff. Seth sprinkled his nose. He had liked her because it seemed just a shadow of his mother in her eyes. She just wants to get in your pants. Shut up, Seth. It's true, Seth said with a shrug, but happily let the subject when Linda came back bearing pizza. Y'all enjoy now, she told them, leaning over the table just a little further than necessary. Case he's in that miss the first time around. So I snagged a piece. Snagged a piece and bit it, knowing it was going to scooch the roof of his mouth. The flavors exploded, making it burn more than worth it. Grace makes pizza from scratch, she said around a mouthful. It's even better than this. Ethan only grunted. Thought of Grace after he entertained, however, unwillingly. A brief and sweaty fantasy about Linda Brewster made him twitchy. Yeah, we ought to see if she'd make it for us one of these days. She comes clean and stuff. She comes tomorrow, right? Yeah. He just took a piece of knowing that most of his appetite had deserted him. I suppose. Maybe she'll make one up before she goes. You're having pizza tonight. So, says polished off the first beat with the speed and precision of a jackal. You could, like, compare. Grace ought to open a diner or something so she could... wouldn't have to work all those different jobs. She's always working. She wants to buy a house. She does. Yeah, she 
said licked the side of his hand with saucer. Just a little one, but it has to have a yard so Aubrey can run around and have a dog and stuff. She told you all that. Sure, I asked you how come she was busting her butt, cleaning all those houses, working down at the pub. She said that was mostly why. And if she doesn't make enough, she and Aubrey won't have a place of their own by the time Aubrey starts kindergarten. I guess even a little house costs big bucks, bucks right? He costs. He didn't say quietly. He remembered how satisfied, how proud he'd been when he bought his own place on the water. What it had meant to him to know he succeeded at what he did. It takes time to save up. Grace wants to have the house by the time Aubrey starts school. After that, she says, how she has to start saving for college. He snorted and decided he could force down a third piece. Hell, Aubrey's just a baby. It's a million years to college. Told her that, too. He had it because it pleases him for people to know that he and Grace had conversations. She just laughed and said five minutes ago, Aubrey had gotten her first tooth. I didn't get it. She made kids grow up fast. Since it didn't look as though his appetite would be coming back, he then closed the top on the pizza and took out Bill's paper. Let's take this back to the boatyard. Since you don't have school in the morning, we can put in a couple more hours. He put in more than a couple. Once he got started, he couldn't seem to stop. He cleared his mind. He kept it from wandering. Wandering. Wondering. Worrying. The boat was definite. A tangible task with a foreseeable end. He knew what he was doing here, just as he knew what he was doing out on the bay. There wasn't so many shadow areas or maybes or what-ifs. He then continued to work even when Seth curled up on top cloth and fell asleep. Sound of tools running didn't appear to disturb him. Though Ethan wondered how anyone could sleep with the best part of a large sausage of pepperoni pizza in his stomach. He started to work on the ends of corner posts for the cabin and cockpit. Cumin while the night wind blew lazily through the open cargo doors, he turned the radio off so that now the only music was the water, the general notes of it sliding across the shore. He worked slowly, carefully, though he was well able to visualize the completed project. Cam, he decided, would handle most of the interior work. He was the most skilled of the three of them at finishing carpentry. Philip could handle the rough ends. He was better at sheer manual labor than he liked to admit. They could keep up the pace. He's and calculated that they could have the boat trimmed and under sail in about in another two months. He would leave, figuring the profits and percentages to Philip. The money would feed the lawyers, the boat yard, and their own bellies. Why well, hadn't Grace, Grace ever told him she wanted to buy a house? He's a frowned thoughtfully as he closed the gravel team bolt. Wasn't that a pretty big step to be discussing with a ten year old boy? Then again, he admitted, set that ask. He was over and only told her she couldn't be working herself so hard. He hadn't asked her why she insisted on it. She had to make things up with her father, he thought again. The two of them would just spend the, that stiff-necked Monroe pride for five minutes so they could come to terms. She got pregnant, and there was no doubt in Ethan's mind that Jack Casey, taking advantage of a young, naive girl, should be shot for it. But that was over and done. His family had never held graduate small or large. They fought, certainly, and he and his brother had often fought physically. But when it was done, it was over. It was true enough that he harbored some seeds of resentment because Cam had raced off to Europe and Philip had moved to Baltimore. It happened so fast after the mother died. He'd still been raw. Everything had changed before he could blink, and he stewed over that. But even with that, he would never have turned his back on either of them if they needed him, and he knew they wouldn't have turned their backs on him. It seemed to him the most foolish and wasteful thing imagining, imaginable that Grace wouldn't ask for help and her father wouldn't offer it. He glanced at the big round clock nail to the wall of the front door. Philip's idea, he didn't remember, was a half grin. Figured they needed to know how much time they were putting in. But as far as Ethan knew, Philip was the only one who bothered to mark down the time. It's nearly one, which meant Grace would be finishing up at the pub in about an hour. Wouldn't hurt the load set in the truck to do a quick swing by Shiny's, just to check on things. Even as he started to rise, he heard the boy whimper. In his sleep, pizza's finally getting to him. He thought was a shake of the head, but he, su but he supposed childhood wouldn't be complete without its quota of belly aches. He climbed down, rolling his shoulders to work out the kinks as he approached the sleeping boy. Crouched beside Seth, laid a hand on his shoulders and gave a gentle shake. The boy came up swinging. Punch first caught Ethan squarely on the mouth and knocked his head back. The shock, more than a quick and bright pain had him swearing he locked the next blow and took says arm. hold it <laughs> get your hands off me wild desperate still caught in the sticky grip of the dream says flail at the air <laughs> get your fucking hands off me understanding came quickly so look at Seth's eyes dark terror and vicious fury he had once felt both himself along with his shuddering helplessness he let go with both of his hands mama you were dreaming he said it quietly, without affliction. Listen, Seth's ragged breath and echoed in there. You fell asleep. <sighs> Seth kept his fist punched. 
He didn't remember falling asleep. He remember curling up with some ease and work. The next thing he knew, he was back in one of those dark rooms where the smells were sour, too humid, and the noises from the next room were too loud and too animal. And one of the faceless men who used his mother's bed had crept out and put hands on him again. But it was Ethan who was watching him patiently with too much knowledge in his serious eyes. Set stomach twisted. Not only had what had been, but that Ethan should know. Ethan should now know, because he couldn't think of words or excuses. Seth simply closed his eyes. It was that which tilted the scales for Ethan, the surrender to helplessness, sliding to shame. He left this wound alone, but now it seemed he wouldn't need to treat it after all. You don't have to be afraid of what was. I'm not afraid of anything, Seth's eyes snapped open. The anger in them was adult and bitter, but his voice jerked like the child he was. I'm not afraid of some stupid dream. You don't have to be ashamed of it either. <laughs> Cause he was hideously set sprang to his feet. His fists were punched again ready. I'm not ashamed of anything, and you don't know a damn thing about it. I know every damn thing about it. Because he did, he hated to speak of it, but despite the defiant stance, the boy was trembling, and he knew just how alone he felt. Speaking of it was the only thing left for him to do. <laughs> the right thing to do. <laughs> I know what dreams did to me. Oh, I had them for a long time after part of things was over for me. So had them now and again, he thought, but there was no need to tell the boy he might have to face a lifetime of flashing back and overcoming. I know what it does to your guts. Bullshit! The tears burning back in Seth's eyes, humiliating him all the more. Nothing's wrong with me. I got the hell out, didn't I? I got away from her, didn't I? I'm not going back either, no matter what. No, you're not going back. He's in grade, no matter what. I don't care what you or anybody thinks about what went on back then. And you're not tricking me into saying things about it by pretending you know. You don't have to say anything about it. You don't. And I don't have to pretend. He picked up the cap, Seth's blow, and knocked off his hand. head. Ran it absolutely through his hands before putting it back on. It was a casual gesture. Did nothing. He used a tight, slight ball of tension in his gut. My mother was a whore. My biological mother. She was a junkie. With a taste for heroin. He kept his gaze on Seth, and his voice, matter of fact, I was younger than you when she sold me the first time to a man who liked young boys. Seth's breathing quick, and as he took a step back, no, was all he could take. Neither Quinn was everything strong was all in. Normal. You're lying. People mostly lie to rag or to get out of some stupid thing they done. I don't see the point either, and less than lying about this. Ethan took his cap off again, because it suddenly felt too tight on his head. Once, twice, he wrecked his hands through his hair. He said, ease the weight. She sold me to men to pay for her habit. The first time, I fought. They didn't stop it, but I fought. The second time, I fought. A few times more after that. Then I didn't bother fighting, because it just made it worse. Ethan's gaze stayed level on the boys. The harsh overhead light says, Eyes were dark, not as calm as they had been when Ethan had begun to speak. Says, Chest hurt. Still remember the breathing. How'd you stand it? I... I stopped caring. Ethan shrugged his shoulders. I stopped being, if you know what I mean. There wasn't anybody I could go to for help, or I didn't know there was. She moved around a lot to keep social workers off her trail. Seth's lips felt dry and tight. He rubbed the back of his hand over them violently. You never knew where you were going to wake up in the morning? Yeah. You never knew. But all the places looked the same. They all smelled the same. But you got out? You got away? Yeah, I got out. One night after her John had finished with both of us, there was some trouble. Screams, blood, curses, pain. I don't remember everything exactly. But the cops came. I must have been in a pretty bad way because they took me to the hospital. Figure things out quick enough. I ended up in the system. I would have stayed there. But the doctor treated me with Stella Quinn. They took you. They took me. And saying that just that soothed the sickness in Ethan's gut. They didn't just change my life. They saved it. I had the dreams for a long time after. The sweaty ones where you wake up trying to breathe. Sure you're back in it. And even when you realize you're not, you're cold for a while. Seth knuckled the tears away, but he did feel ashamed of them now. I always got away. Sometimes they put their hands on me, but I got away. None of them ever. Good for you. I still wanted to kill them. And her. I wanted to. I know. I didn't want to tell anybody. I think Ray knew. Cam sort of knows. I didn't want anybody to think I... To look at me and think... You can't express it. The shame of having anyone look at him. See what happened. And what could have happened in those dark smelling rooms? Why did you tell me? Because you need to know. 
It doesn't make you less of a man. He's in waiting, knowing that Seth would decide whether he accepted the truth or that of that. What Seth saw was a man, tall, strong, self-possessed, with big, colossal hands and quiet eyes. One of the weights that hung on his heart lifted. I guess I do, and he smiled. Your mouth's bleeding. He said that at the back of his hand and knew they'd cross a thin, shaky line. He got a good right jab. I never saw it coming. He held out a hand, testing. Ruffled says sleep tumbled there. The boy smiled, stayed in place. Let's clean up, he said, and go home. End of chapter four.